Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we have had so much fun trying out all of the features like Q&As and polls that let us be really creative and engage with our audience. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. We've got a lot to talk about today on Podcast Royal, from four new royal titles to a christening in California to two beautiful new photos of the Princess of Wales and her children for Mother's Day, Commonwealth Day festivities, and the seemingly confirmed role of all three of the Wales children in the coronation. Plus, there was a royal wedding since our last episode. Did you catch the bride in Dior? All of this and so much more on episode 88. Welcome back to Podcast Royal. How are you this week, Rachel? I'm good. I just told you a second ago before we started recording that I feel like I am behind the eight ball in everything in life right now. I feel like I'm like running crazy trying to just like keep up, but I am good. How are you? I am doing great too. I've had a lot of home projects going on the past few weeks. So um, I've been keeping really busy. Yeah. And you are, what are you doing to the stairs, like to the walls of the stairs? Cause it, this is just so beyond my comprehension. I'm not like home Depot and Lowe's are like the last place on <laughs> earth that I ever want to go. So what exactly are you doing to, to the house? Yeah. So I, when I moved into my house, the stairwell was pretty plain, just a plain wall. And I started looking at a lot of photos on Pinterest and I decided to add a chair rail and some box molding going up the staircase. And I just finished right before we started recording doing the last coat of paint. So I'm really happy with it. Um, I think it turned out really great and it was definitely a learning experience. I have not done anything like this before. So, um, I mean, a real authentic DIY project, um, but it turned out, it turned out pretty good and it wasn't as tough as I thought it would be. I did have to get a little bit of help from my dad on the chair rail because getting that up the incline, you know, on the stairs was, was tough, but he got me, um, he got it all put together like in an hour. And then I was able to go back and do the rest of the trim. So I don't know what any of what you just said means, but it looks really nice. (laughs) I've seen the the Instagram stories and it looks really good. I mean, you and the princess of Wales, make me, and, and I feel like I'm a pretty accomplished woman and you and the princess of Wales make me feel like I don't do anything. Cause you guys are just, you are a Jill of all trades. You can cook like crazy. You can do DIY home projects and it's impressive. I yeah. just dabble in a lot of things. <laughs> well, I'm impressed. Well, speaking of having a lot to catch up on, that is our episode today. We have so much to cover. So I'm just going to get right into the Royal Rundown. We have got some stuff to talk about today. So a completely full Royal Rundown. Congratulations, first of all, are in order to Princess Lilibet Diana, either Mountbatten, Windsor or Sussex. I'm not really sure at this point after the title change, which we'll talk about in just a second. I'm not really sure which surname she and Prince Archie will go by, but Lily was christened on Friday, March 3rd at her home in Montecito, California. About 25 or so people were in attendance for her service, which was performed by the Archbishop of Los Angeles. She and big brother Archie even shared a dance at the party after. That would have been adorable to see. 
there was a gospel choir. Godfather Tyler Perry was there. And the playlist at the after party is said to have mirrored that of the wedding reception of her parents, Harry and Meghan. So I can bet that Wilson Pickett's uh, Land of a Thousand Dances, which was Harry and Meghan's first dance song. We learned that in the Netflix docuseries. I bet that was probably played. So though the royal family was apparently invited, they did not attend, but Harry did have family in attendance in the form of Princess Diana's sisters. I think this is really sweet. Lady Jane Fellows and Lady Sarah McCorkadale. So Meghan's mother, Doria Raglan, no surprise, was also there. In the announcement that Lily had been christened, There was also a confirmation of she and Archie's princess and prince titles, respectively. The Sussexes put the announcement out on Wednesday, March 8th, which was exactly, by the way, this was not lost on me, six months to the day after her late majesty's passing, which of course is when Lily's grandfather, King Charles, became king, thereby entitling her and Archie, as well as, of course, Prince George, Princess Charlotte, and Prince Louis, who already had titles, to prince and princess titles. This is per the letters patent of 1917. I know we've talked about this on the show before. It's complicated. But the next day, which was Thursday, March 9th, the royal family updated the line of succession on its website to reflect the title. So it used to be Master Archie Mountbatten-Windsor and Miss Lilibet Mountbatten-Windsor. But now, if you look, it is Prince Archie of Sussex and Princess Lilibet of Sussex. In a statement surrounding the titles, Harry and Meghan called the titles Archie and Lily's birthright. So they have titles. We were wondering about this. We were wondering, especially, we're going to talk about Denmark later in the show, but especially after everything that happened in Denmark, we were wondering, you know, maybe Archie and Lily aren't going to get titles. So they have them. So what are your thoughts? Well, Remember back when Megan and Harry interviewed with Oprah, you know, they claimed at the time that they had been denied the prince title for Archie and that it was his right. Um, you know, and I've actually heard recently others in the U.S. kind of echoing this claim. And to your point, we did talk about this on our podcast several months ago. And I remember I debunked that on our show. So I specifically recall calling out the 1917 letters patent and how the prince and princess title is given to grandchildren of the monarch. So (laughs) listeners will remember when Archie was born, he was not the grandson of the monarch. He was the great grandson. So um, he was not eligible for the title at that time. The same rules applied for other great grandchildren of the monarch with the exception of Prince George, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis. And that's because their father was the eldest child of the Prince of Wales. Mm -hmm. So you know, we we did, however, learn that when Archie was born, Queen Elizabeth offered him the title of the Earl of Dumbarton. And for whatever reason, the Sussexes turned down that title. And I don't think we ever officially knew um, why they turned that down. But once it's kind of a it, cumbersome title, that, I mean, that might be like the Earl of Dum- Dumbarton. I don't know. I I can't speak for them, but. Well, once King Charles became the monarch, you know, the children did become eligible to take the prince and princess titles. And that was if Harry and Meghan chose to give it to them. Um, But we really didn't hear any confirmation of that last fall. Um, There was a lot going on at that time. So fast forward to this month, you know, we see this media announcement about the titles for Archie and Lily, which dropped right before the new Duke of Edinburgh's title that we'll get to in a second. So if you notice the Duke of Edinburgh's title, And the Wales's title, which they were given a few months back, were both official announcements from Buckingham Palace and King Charles himself. Um, The prince and princess titles were dropped by People magazine. So very different sources. So I thought that was really interesting because everybody was trying to figure out, you know, how this came about and did Charles all of a sudden make this decision? Um, You know, did they have a conversation? And It looks to me like there weren't really official conversations or confirmation between Harry and Charles, you know, prior to sharing this news in March. You know, I feel like, you know, the royal website was not updated until after the announcement came. Can I interject there really quick, Jessica? They, um, I reported on this and they, this was decided right before Christmas by the King and the Sussexes. Um, Now, however, there was no plan to announce it like they like here I I believe from everything that I've learned that the conversation was had that the children would have the titles before Christmas which is also interestingly enough before spare came out um I don't know if that has anything to do with anything um but 
I don't think that the Sussexes told um, the palace that they were going to be releasing the news of the titles when they did. I think that from what I can understand, that was, even though everything was confirmed, it was a surprise when it was announced. Right. Yeah. And that was kind of where I was going with that was they may have had a conversation at some point, but it seems to me like the Sussexes decided that they would just start using them this month um, Mm -hmm. because I feel like otherwise we would have seen the announcement come out officially from the monarch or we would have seen the website updated prior to the announcement. Um, So, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of talk right now around why Harry and Meghan chose to do this. I mean, you know, we've all heard the conversations. um, We've all heard the claims they've made about the royal family, um, you know, a lot of the attacks on their reputation. Um, And so, you know, I think a lot of people are asking if you feel the way you feel about the royal family, why would you want to be associated with them and and have your children carry these titles in that way. So, um, you know, and, and, you know, you can also make the argument they're living in the United States full time, probably have no plans to really spend much time in the UK at all. So what do the titles provide them, you know, living in the U S and, and I don't, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, it's, there's a, there's a lot there and the timing is interesting because, the Frogmore news had just come out. So it was kind of like a bit of a step. I I hate to use the phrase step back because that's been so overused with Harry and Meghan, like, you know, when they stepped back in 2020, but, you know, the Frogmore news was a bit, I guess, of a, of a distance, if you will, of them from the Royal family. And then the next week with this title news, it was like, they're back in the fold, you know, Um, they're right. Harry and Meghan are right. This is the children's birthright. However, as you just said, it, it, it's all, it's very confusing because yes, it is their birthright, but also it doesn't seem as though they really are pleased with their treatment in the Royal family, but yet they want these children to have these titles. And, um, and I've also read that you know, they're not going to, obviously, I mean, they're in California, they're not going to, you know, be referred to as Princess Lilibet and Prince Archie, you know, at school or anything like that. It's just the formal title. They won't use them in in regular everyday life, but it is a little bit confusing and how I've never been able to understand the Sussexes process and, and their, and their thinking behind their the way that they announce things, the way, like, I never understood Oprah, for example, I didn't really understand, I don't understand a lot of their decisions that they do with the media, but it just continues to be a complicated story. I wonder if it has something to do with the coronation. As of right now, I don't think that um, because of their age, not because of anything else, I don't think Archie and Lily have been invited to the actual ceremony itself. I'm hearing that Harry and Meghan are making some pretty grandiose demands um, to, to attend the coronation, including riding in the procession from Westminster Abbey to the palace and being on the balcony. And so I don't know. I mean, I just, they're, they're right because, and I, and I'm sorry if I sound confused because, because I am confused, but they, it is their birthright, but you're right. In, in, in a time where it seems that Harry and Meghan are pretty nonplussed with the Royal family, why would you want, I I don't, I don't know the rationale. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts that you want to add? I I feel, I mean, I feel like I'm rambling and making no sense because it it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but. um, Yeah. You know, I mean, I feel like it's, it's really unfortunate for the kids because they don't really have a say in any of this. And, um, you know, we've seen other members of the family like Sophie and Edward who chose not to give their kids prince and princess titles because of, you know, the burden that may bring um, or the challenges they may have with that. But at 18, you know, they would be able to choose to take those titles if they want. So it seems like that might've been a great option for Archie and Lily to let them choose for themselves at 18. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I mean, you know, it's all, it feels very contradictory. The claims that we've heard come out of Harry and Meghan about the Royal family, but then also pushing so hard to be um, in a pretty, you know, 
prominent role in the in the coronation if they're asking to be part of the procession I had not heard that mm-hmm. um you know and, and to be on the balcony because I don't think from what I had heard I don't think other non-working royals were um supposed to be part of that in that way well, so. they're they're not just kind of like the platinum jubilee also another demand that they're allegedly I mean this is all allegedly right like I don't have like the email or the you know letter with all of the so-called demands but the they want to ride in the procession they want to be on the balcony and of course may 6th which is the day of the coronation is also archie's fourth birthday and so they want apparently some kind of acknowledgement at 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 a reception or at dinner and drinks or something like that of his birthday like a happy birthday shout out i guess for lack of a better term i think that's it, but that's enough. I mean, that's a, that's a lot. And so, um, yeah, it's just, I, I don't understand. And I feel like a lot of this stuff, I think it's all surrounding the coronation. Like they want to get these prince and princess titles out there mm-hmm. before the coronation. And I'm not a hundred percent sure why listeners, I mean, if you have insight into this, we welcome your emails, we welcome your DMS, but, um, To me, this day feels like it should really be focused on, you know, one, the the UK and the Commonwealth, also King Charles, Prince William and Prince George really is where, you know, kind of the spotlight should be on that day. Um, I feel like bringing attention to other members of the family doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, I can understand why the Wales children would have a role in, in some capacity, um, given that they are Prince William's children and he is in line to be the next king. Um, but, you know, the focus to me feels like it should be on, you know, like I just said, um, the the Commonwealth and the king and, and the future um, mm-hmm. monarchs. Well, and Charles, of course, really wants Harry to be at the coronation, not only because that's his son and he and he loves him, but also because as the king, he is he is supposed to be a uniter. Right. And if he can't even get his own family all there, you know, that that's not that's not a great look for him. So I think that Charles, obviously Charles really wants his son and I'm sure his daughter in law and his grandchildren there. This is one of the biggest days of his life whether he will bend and acquiesce to these so-called demands, if, if that is, if the demands are true, we'll have to see, but it's going to be interesting and still, so it's still no word yet, by the way, on whether the Sussexes will attend the coronation. They have been invited. We'll update you listeners. As we know that RSVP deadline is coming up. It's at the, I believe it's at the beginning of April. And so before we move on, is there anything else you want to say about the titles? I feel like I was just like rambling for nothing, but I don't really know. I mean, I just yeah. I've never really understood the method to the Sussexes. I mean, the, I, I was about to say the method to the madness that that's going to come across wrong and I'll probably end up in the tabloids for saying that they're mad or something like that. But um, I've never really understood their thought process on a lot of their decisions. And this is why, why choosing to release it now is is another decision that I I don't know I mean there's maybe there's some inside baseball that I'm not aware of I'm sure there is but I don't know but they did it yeah I agree um same thoughts as you they did it so it's out there they the that question at least has been answered and quick Megan side note listeners Megan is apparently going to be relaunching the TIG which is her lifestyle blog she had before she got married to Harry in the coming weeks or possibly even the coming days. So watch for that. I'm, I'm actually personally really excited for that. I enjoyed reading the TIG. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. I did not, I've, I've never to this day watched Suits. I, I've been meaning it's on my watch list to watch, but I've, I've never watched the show. So I didn't know who she was prior to her dating Harry, which I don't mean to like demean her in any way. I just, I just didn't know who she was. And, uh, but when I did find out that they were dating and I obviously was very interested in that in the fall of 2016, I started reading the TIG, which was still active. It was active from 2014 until April of 2017. And I loved the TIG. I thought it was cool. It had travel, uh, food, um, all kinds of lifestyle stuff. And so, um, you know, wrapping up the title conversation last episode, it was Royal household musical chairs. And this episode it's Royal title musical chairs. So there's other title changes going on. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, definitely. You know, right after we heard about Archie and Lily's titles, Buckingham Palace announced Prince Edward has received the Duke of Edinburgh title. The announcement came on his birthday, and we were really excited to see this because so many people had been hoping this would happen really for quite some time. And it was well known that his father, Prince Philip, who held the Duke of Edinburgh title before Edward, had wanted the title to be passed down to him. So, you know, a lot of people were sort of disappointed that this hadn't happened yet. Like I said, we finally got the news on his 59th birthday. Um, this means that his son, James, has inherited the Earl of Wessex title. Mm-hmm. So all of the discussion and anticipation around the title, you know, sparked a lot of conversation about how and when the Duke title is given to someone. The announcement from Buckingham Palace stated that the title will be held by Prince Edward for His Royal Highness's lifetime. So this actually indicates that the title won't be automatically inherited by James. It'll actually go back to the crown upon his death, um, which really seems to be in line with the expectation that Charles wants a slimmed down monarchy. Um, This way, the monarch will have more control over the next person to hold the title. And Rachel, I actually remember suggesting this on the podcast when we discussed Mm -hmm. it several months ago, because there was a lot of chatter around whether or not Princess Charlotte should be the Duchess of Edinburgh. Yeah. And I remember I asked the question whether it could be given to Prince Edward for the duration of his life, but then not passed down and then maybe passed on to Charlotte. You know, I don't know if that's what they'll do, but it's interesting to see that it is an option and it's what King Charles has chosen to do right now. Well, obviously, that just means Buckingham Palace is listening to the show and getting great ideas from you. (laughs) I hope so. (laughs) Obviously. Okay. So as um, I'm not, and I want to clarify, I'm not confused about Archie and Lily having titles. It's their birthright. They're absolutely right about that. What I'm confused about is the timing of everything. But as, as much as I might be confused about that, I am not confused at all about this one. This is the right decision. I love this for Edward. And you know who else I love this for? Sophie. I love this so much for Sophie. I don't think that you can find a harder working Royal. I mean, princess Anne, yes, but like non-blood than Sophie. And I just, I, I I think this is wonderful. Like hearing Sophie called the Duchess, that just, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with countess, but I'm so happy for them. This was absolutely the right decision. This is what Um, The queen and Prince Philip always wanted as far back as the late nineties, as far back as Edward's wedding in 1999. And they deserve this. This is the right move. And I'm so pleased to see also that Edward has taken over the Duke of Edinburgh awards, which meant so much to his father. So I 100% support this decision and I'm so happy for them. Well, and speaking of Edward and Sophie again, you know, we saw them last week at the Commonwealth Day service at Westminster Abbey, and I posted on our Instagram account that Sophie made her Duchess debut, I called it. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you saw the photos of her, but wasn't her outfit gorgeous? Yeah, Sophie is is a beautiful woman, Not, not only on the outside, but on the inside as well. She looked beautiful and I mean I'm 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 telling you I'm I'm thrilled for Edward and happy belated birthday Prince Edward by the way which was March 10th but um I'm just as thrilled for Sophie too because this is this is wonderful for them well she wore an ivory colored coat dress and a hat with these really simple minimal black details so there was a black button on the front of her coat and this beautiful black ribbon detail on the back of her hat and I have to say she won best dress for me that day Mm -hmm. I know uh, everyone really seemed to love princess Catherine's two-piece peplum coat I didn't I didn't I'm sure I'll I'm sure I'll end up in the tabloids again for this but I I did not like that outfit but it was not my favorite either you know it was this navy color with the white floral pattern embroidered on the outside and then there was the reverse white with the navy floral on the inside of the skirt which was a cool detail um and she had also worn um a pair of earrings that previously belonged to princess Diana as well as the prince of Wales brooch Mm -hmm. um but you know Again, like I think Sophie won best dress that day. I yeah, loved same, her outfit. Same. She did a great job picking that out. Um, so um I, I think it sounds like you agree with me. Yeah, one hundred percent. I actually really love her hair too. Um, and would love to try that hair. I would never be able to do it on myself, but um it's yeah, she's beautiful and the outfit was great. And I did not like Kate's outfit for what it's worth. Um, but um, but yes, 
to the tabloids that I will not name you by your publication name. I do think Kate is a fashion <laughs> icon. You, Jessica and I had the greatest laugh about that story over dinner a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> anyway, I think Kate is a fashion icon. I just want to go on record saying that now. I think you do as well, um, but did not like the Commonwealth Day look. No, I love a lot of her outfits, but I will be fair and and I will call out the ones that, and sometimes they're great outfits, but they're just not my personal taste. Um, sure, so, sure, you know, sure. try to be fair in that way. But okay, so we also saw King Charles give a speech where he talked about the late Queen Elizabeth. He said, Commonwealth Day was an occasion of particular pride for my beloved mother, the late Queen a treasured opportunity to celebrate our Commonwealth family to whose service she dedicated her long and remarkable life. He talked about drawing from her example and its near boundless potential as a force for good. And as a reminder to listeners, Commonwealth Day is an annual recognition and celebration of the countries that make up the Commonwealth. So, okay, I've got to talk to you about something else. Okay. Speaking of Commonwealth Day, we saw Camilla in this very royal blue outfit. She um, was also in a coat dress. You know, she had this matching hat with a feather. She was wearing the sapphire diamond brooch that belonged to the late Queen Elizabeth. Um, we've been seeing her a lot in this royal blue color lately. And I remember we've you been commented seeing about Camilla this. So I'm sorry to cut you off. I, we've been seeing Camilla in so much blue. Like, is this like her her color? Like, right. Well, so I remembered blue. you commenting on this color when she wore a royal blue dress to the state mm-hmm. banquet with the president of South Africa. Um, so I'm curious to know what you think about her wearing all this blue. If you're a fan or not, or uh, if you have thoughts on it. She looks good in blue. I mean, this is a beautiful color. It's like a. It, it really is like a royal blue and. Um, and I, and I like it. Yeah. I mean, but I, I don't know. She wears a lot of blue, um, to the point where it's like almost not a coincidence anymore. Um, but you know, I mean, I guess she shakes it up, but yeah, I, I love the color. Um, yeah, I, I, I am not mad at this outfit. Yeah. I mean, I think the blue looks great on her. I just feel like I'm ready to see her in some different colors. I'm a little tired. I agree. I agree. We like, I, I mean, yeah, like let's, I don't know. Maybe we're just so used to Queen Elizabeth and just the rainbow of colors, but, um, I just, yeah, I want, I want more than just blue, but um, I mean, maybe that's just what she thinks. Like I, I prefer red and green on myself. So we just Mm -hmm. like different colors on ourselves, I guess, but. Well, I also want to mention the Princess of Wales engagement with the Irish Guards last week. So as a reminder, she became the honorary colonel of the Irish Guards following the death of Queen Elizabeth. This engagement occurred on a rather snowy day in England. She was dressed in camouflage and he she had her hair in these French braids. She participated um, in a training where she got to learn about treating a wound on a soldier. She heard about the Irish Guards recent efforts to assist park rangers in East Africa with stopping poaching. And I thought this was a really interesting engagement. When I saw the photos from the day pop up online, I was reading more. So they were on different um, like celebrity Instagram accounts and websites. Mm -hmm. And I saw a lot of comments on social media, mostly from Americans. Um, They seem to be sort of critical of this engagement. They thought her activities weren't really adding a whole lot of value. Um, And and so I was curious to know your thoughts on this. And if you think royals have a role to participate in this sort of event. Well, those doggone Americans. (laughs) Never happy with anything. Um, (laughs) No, I mean, I, I think they, I think it adds enormous value because what she's doing is she's making like, for example, I'm going to be honest with you. Maybe I, maybe me, Rachel sitting over here in the United States would not have known about the Irish guards were it not for Kate. And so she's bringing awareness to them. And um, we're going to talk about St. Patrick's day in a minute, which also involves obviously the Irish guards. And yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think that, that I, I don't see anything wrong with that. Like, I, I think that she is bringing awareness like it's the to me it's the equivalent I mean maybe I'm missing something but it's the equivalent of like you know the president or first lady going to visit the troops and and you know like see what they're like see what they're up to and so I I don't get the criticism so I completely agree with you 
I can see from an American's perspective how it may be hard to understand the role of the royals when it comes to their patronages, their various organizations that they support, and the service members they work with. But if you listen to Catherine's speech, she specifically said, I'm here to listen to you, to support you, and to champion you in all you do. So we know the influence they have. I mean, they can shine a light on an issue and bring awareness to something when the public really needs to know about it. And they're so powerful when it comes to fundraising or coordinating other support to various organizations they're involved with. Like you said, a lot of people may not have even known what the Irish Guards were before the other day. So, you know, of course, Princess Catherine will not be on the training field every day. Um, this is an honorary role, but I think she can show support in a lot of ways. And I think it is really important. Yeah, it's extremely important. And Kate continued her colonel role on St. Patrick's Day last Friday. She took the salute for the first time at the annual parade, um, the Irish Guards Parade. Prince William was also there. He even called her Colonel Catherine. And the two at one point sipped on Guinness, as one is prone to do on St. Patrick's Day. Kate wore a teal Catherine Walker coat, not green. What did you think of her opting for that teal over traditional green? Okay. I loved this look on Catherine. Now, you know, we might've criticized the Commonwealth day look, Mm -hmm. but this was probably one of my favorites we've seen her in, in a while. You know, I love a good coat dress look and I actually really liked the more teal tone green color. I thought it was really pretty. It was different. I thought her hat was beautiful with those little delicate folds. Mm -hmm. And you know what else I loved, Rachel? (laughs) I know where you're going with this thing. Cute Irish wolfhound dressed in his little red coat. Oh my (laughs) gosh. I, (laughs) that made my day. Did you see him? (laughs) I did. And I knew that you would call out the dog (laughs) because (laughs) you're such a dog lover, which so am I, but you, you more so than, than me for sure. But yeah, I loved the color. I mean, it was just a little bit different. The color is beautiful. I loved, I loved this look. I absolutely. And like, I feel like we, we seem like we like just love Kate to stick in her little coat dress, Catherine Walker box, but like that I love when she takes fashion risks, but just not all fashion risks, I guess. Like the, the black gloves didn't do it for me at the BAFTAs, the, um, the Erdem outfit at Commonwealth, they didn't do it for me, but I feel like on Friday we saw Kate in her fashion element. She looked beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it was her classic signature style, and she wears it really well, and I just think it's beautiful. It's a royal look to me. Yeah, absolutely. So this past Sunday, um, as ever, listeners, I, say, I feel like I say this every single episode, we record on Tuesdays, just in case you didn't know, sarcasm, you knew, um, but this past Sunday, so two days ago, was Mother's Day in the UK, and we got two adorable new Matt Porteous photos of Kate with her three kids. So the photos appear to be from the same summertime shoot in Norfolk that was used in the Wales family Christmas card last year. Everyone is in the same outfits. And for the first shot, Kate is in a tree with her trio. See what I did there? Um, Mm -hmm. Talk about a family tree. And uh, (laughs) my bad jokes will end now. And then the second shot, if you scroll, she is lovingly, it's beautiful photo, holding Louis. She's looking at him with a mother's adoration. And Charles and Camilla also posted what I thought was a really touching tribute to their mothers, both of whom are no longer with us. Of course, the queen died last September and Camilla's mother, Rosalind Shan, died back in 1994. So I love to see these posts to mark these holidays. And of course, we always love new family photos of the Waleses. So what did you think? I loved the photos too. I thought it was really nice to get a glimpse of them in a more candid, personal shot. And I do think my favorite was the photo of Princess Catherine holding Prince Louis. You could see how great of a relationship she has with her kids and how much she really loves them. Of course, I love the throwback photo of King Charles. That was really <laughs> cute. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I feel like you could see his adult face and his baby face. You know, mm-hmm. you know it was mm-hmm. <laughs> it looked like him. Mm-hmm. I would have loved to have gotten a photo of Camilla with her mom when she was a baby. I think that would have been really cool to see. Mm-hmm. Um, but they were all really great photos. Absolutely. And Speaking of the Wales kids, there were some leaked coronation rehearsal documents and that show that all three 
of the Wales kids. That means George, Charlotte, and yes, Louie will be at the coronation and they will all take part in the carriage procession. We kind of mentioned this earlier in the show from the ceremony at Westminster Abbey back to Buckingham Palace where they will then go on and be on the balcony. So the three kids will ride with their parents in the carriage behind the gold state coach, which will carry the king and queen. I guess we've got to start calling Camilla queen now, which is still a little bit hard for me, but um, I think after May 6th, she will, um, it won't be queen. We're not calling her queen consort anymore, I guess calling her queen. So I'm going to have to get over myself, but Louis attendance was a little bit up in the air kind of the like unspoken spoken royal rule of thumb is kids that are under five don't go to things although louis was at the platinum jubilee of course but louis will have just turned five two weeks prior to the coronation on april 23rd so he is officially deemed old enough to attend and i'm going to be honest with you jessica i hope (laughs) maybe Mm -hmm. i'm going to hell for this but i'm praying for some louis antics personally i i live for this child i want him to behave during the ceremony but i need some like carriage procession balcony like antics to happen because <laughs> I the platinum jubilee is still seared in my mind I'm obsessed with this child yes some entertainment from Prince Louis is always a crowd pleaser and you know I think to an extent that is expected at these events I mean they are quite long for a young child and there are a lot of rules to follow and I think the royals understand some of that is just going to happen Honestly, you know, photos that came out of the Jubilee last year were really positive for the Waleses, I felt like. Parents around the world could totally relate to Catherine and having to manage a child in public like that. Yeah, and Mike Tyndall, just don't feed the kids sugar this time, okay? Like, <laughs> keep 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 Louie away from Mike Tyndall and we should be okay. Well, the first continue for Charles ahead of his coronation. So new stamps with his, with his image on them have been released. The stamps feature 10 different British garden flowers, including peonies, roses, and sweet pea, reflecting the King's love of nature and gardening. And those are actually some of my favorite flowers as well. So, Mm -hmm. um, they go on sale tomorrow, March 23rd, and he and Camilla leave on tour later this week for France and Germany as their first, um, King and Queen consort tour together. So it's really exciting. I'm excited to cover that in our next episode. So as we wrap up the Royal Rundown today, that went fast. Like we had a lot to cover and we just covered it in one fell swoop, I feel like. But Kate is expanding her Shaping Us campaign. She today, Tuesday, is bringing, as of today, is bringing it into the business and finance world. She initially launched it to academic and mental health experts. So her early years campaign continued today, Tuesday, of course, when Kate visited NatWest Bank's London headquarters for her first meeting of her new business task force for early childhood. This comes about two months after she launched Shaping Us back in January, which was created with the belief that early childhood holds the key to people's long-term health and well-being. So whew, that was a lot in the Royal Rundown. Is there anything else we need to say about the British royal family before we move into actually quite a bit this episode of news from royals around the world. Yeah, I know. I think we've covered it and I'm excited to get into royals around the world this week. Yeah, we have a lot going on in royals around the world. So listeners, I don't know if you caught this royal wedding on March 12th, but if you didn't, you've got to go and look at the photos from this. There was a stunning royal wedding that we have to talk about. Princess Iman of Jordan married Jamil Thermiotis. I hope I'm saying that right. Thermiotis on March 12th. It was a Sunday in a beautiful Dior gown. It was complete with the tiara and long veil. She was absolutely breathtaking. Iman is the daughter of King Abdullah II and Queen Rania. I love the Jordanian royal family. And it actually, her wedding won't be the last Jordanian royal wedding of 2023. Her older brother, Crown Prince Hussein, will get married, who actually walked her down the aisle, by the way, will get married himself on June 1st. And the more I look at Iman's wedding dress, the more in love with it I fall. It is somehow timeless and modern all at once. And she's also wearing her mother's diamond tiara. So wondering your thoughts on the look. 
I thought it was a really beautiful gown. It's very simple and classic, but it's also very elegant and perfectly tailored as you would expect. You know, the tiara I thought was also simple and understated. And I think that's really important in a wedding because you really want the outfit to draw attention to the bride and not distract from her. So I think a big shiny tiara would have been too much. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it makes me think of the Wales' wedding. You know, Princess Catherine had a relatively small understated tiara as well, I thought anyway, which worked really perfectly for her look as well. So congratulations yeah. to the happy couple. Yeah, they, they're they a beautiful couple. It was a beautiful wedding. Well, moving on, the Royal Household of Spain announced that Princess Leonor will begin a three-year military training to prepare for her future role as Spain's head of state. So Leonor is the oldest of King Philippe the sixth and Queen Letizia's two daughters. And as heir to the Spanish throne, she will one day become Supreme Commander of Spain's Armed Forces. So her military training will start in August after she finishes school at the UWC Atlantic College in Wales, where she actually studies alongside another royal princess Alexia of the Netherlands. So Leonor will spend her first year of training serving with the army. Then she will move on to a naval school and her three, uh, she'll end her three years at the General Air Academy. So that's really exciting. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but you know, I mean, literally it's boots on the ground work. I, I respect that. I love that. Yeah, totally. Um, that I think I think it's really important before you step into a role like that. Mm-hmm. And to follow up on a story from last week, you may remember Princess Madeline of Sweden is leaving the U.S. for home. Um, so she had lived in Florida for several years, and before that, she was in New York City. Um, she'll be headed back to. Sweden later this year, but Prince Joachim of Denmark and his family are moving to Washington, D.C. this summer, where he will start a job at the Danish embassy on September 1st. So this comes after last year's controversy within the Danish royal family, specifically surrounding Joachim. Denmark's Queen Marguerite announced that she was stripping Joachim's four children of their prince and princess titles and his or her highness stylings at the beginning of this year. Listeners, you might remember this announcement. Um, You know, it created a lot of tension within the Danish royal family. And Joachim told the press that he felt blindsided and was only given five days notice of this news. The queen, you know, she did maintain that the plans had been in motion for quite a while and the decision was in the best interest of her grandchildren. So, um, you know, we we remember that story. We had talked about that as it related to Prince Charles and people thinking that he was hoping to have a slim down monarchy. Um, But overall, welcome um, Prince Joachim and family to Washington, D.C. Yeah, we lost one European royal and we got one in her place. <laughs> so, um, and I'm honestly not surprised that that, that happened. That, that did not go over well um, with, with him and his family. So, um, I mean, I hope, you know, relationally that everything is okay, but um, I think maybe a little distance will do everybody good for a little Well, while. you know, Rachel, I think he had been living in Paris before this. Yeah, but- I think you're right, actually there had already been a little bit of distance there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, Hey, if that's, what's best for the family, then we support it. We love doing the Royals around the world content. I mean, we just went from the UK to Jordan, to Spain, to Denmark in one fell swoop. So I love, I love it when we have a uh, stacked Royals around the world, um, which we don't always have, but we did this week. Okay. So we did that. So um, anything else for the good of the order before we wrap up? I think that's it for me. Okay, well, a quick note to end on. Happy birthday tomorrow, March 23rd, to Princess Eugenie, who turns 33. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Podcast Royal. Email us at hellopodcastroyal at gmail.com. And please follow, rate, and review our podcast. We appreciate those five-star reviews so much. And thank you, as always, for tuning in. This is episode 88 of Podcast Royal. Bye. Bye. Bye.